and even work the bridge on that. But let's just do that together. So if you let's say you have five thousand homeowners, and there and there's uh, ten percent of those move, or I mean those move every ten years. I'm not very good at math. Help me out here. <laughs> so five thousand. I mean I think it's fifty. If you've got uh, if there's going to be ten percent of the year, five thousand divided by fifty. Seventy one. Seventy one. Five thousand. We said seven years or ten. Seven to ten, but I always I'm always conservative. So let's just let's say ten. So that's a hundred a hundred moves a year. Okay, so <clears throat> I always say if you can capture 20% of the business, then you're dominating the market. So there's going to be 100 moves a year with 5,000 homeowners. Then if you're capturing 20% of that, then that's 20 moves that you should be able to close on. And so that would be your goal for 5,000 homeowners, 20, move, 20 people selling their home a year. So to have 20 people selling their home a year in a group of 5,000 homeowners, then <clears throat> that's um, how many listing presentations you need to go on. As a new agent, you're probably you're not your closing rate. My closing rate was about 80 percent, but that took me you know a couple of years to get that high. So as a new agent, your closing rate is usually about 50 percent. So with 20 let's say 20 sales a year, then that's going to be, let's say 40, uh, let's just round it up to 50 listing appointments a year that you need to go on. So 50 divided by 12, that's how many months. We're talking more about business planning than we are listing presentation, but I think it's important for you to kind of understand these things as you're working on your listing presentation. So Richard, you said how many, four a month? Okay. Yeah, so four listing presentations. So that's basically one listing presentation a week. So that would be your goal is one listing presentation a week that's within your geographic farm, your area that you're targeting. So whether these are your sphere of influence, people that you've worked with, you know, if you're a postman, people that are in your postal route, if you're a school teacher, other peers or people you know from school, if it's if you're not targeting a specific niche or a specific sphere of influence, then it needs to be your, you know, your geographic area. So, and it can be both. One doesn't have to be separate from the other, but um, you want to make sure you have, you know, 5,000 people that you're targeting. And that's, so that's the way I approached my business when I started this. And um, that's where a lot of my, a lot of my business came from. So now with that being said, how did I my listing um, my my listing business in the uptown Turtle Creek area? I knew that I needed an assistant to manage my my listings. So that's the other thing I want to chat with you guys about a little bit is the evolution of a team. You know, how is it you put a team together and what what needs to happen first in what order? Well. Um, this is why I always say spend 70% of your time on listing business development. So that's why of all classes, this is one of the most important classes because if you're spending 70% of your time, it should be revolved around what we're going to talk about today, which is listing business development. If you do that consistently, then you'll be, you'll be needing an assistant in the next 12 months, I guarantee it. And once you have that assistant and you're able to um, manage your time better, then that's when your profitability really increases and your lifestyle gets better because you're able to manage your time. Until then, it's going to be tough. Until then, just you've got your work cut out for you. You know, it's really because you're having to spend 70% of your normal work day on listing business development, which is a lot of it is prospecting. And then you're also having to manage and service those listings. And you're also having to deal with buyer inquiries and, and sellers that have questions all the time. And, you're having to take the those once you get properties under contract, take them to close. So it's a lot of stuff going on. It's a lot of working parts. So the way you <clears throat> manage your time becomes real important. And we hear people talk about time management all the time. And 
when you're a new agent or when you don't have a listing inventory, time management is it's pretty simple. Uh, for me, it's like, well, you know, I've got all this time, so I'll just prospect. It made it easier for me to prospect than it ever did. For me, the hardest thing was maintaining that that consistency and maintaining those habits when I had a lot of listings and when I had a lot of buyers and sellers. And that's where a lot of realtors fail is they get that, that, that momentum up and then they stop their marketing and they stop their prospecting and then they go back down the valley and they have to start over again. It's almost like they're out of business and they have to start again. So then they can never afford that assistant. And that's where I want you guys to be aware of that up front. So that way when you do, when you can't afford you know, <clears throat> the extra hours, you're going to have to work a lot of hours in a day. You're going to, have to spend a lot of time on prospecting, a lot of time on business development. That needs to be your primary focus, even when you grow your business. When I was when I was selling 55, 60 homes a month, I still constantly thought about listing business development. How can I make sure I'm developing more listing business? And so, no matter how much volume you're doing, that always needs to be top of mind um, because the profit will follow, and the more your profitability increases then the better job you can do servicing that client. You can really, that's when you can really tweak and refine. You know, we always had doormats on our properties. We always had, our graphics were the best that was available. I mean, we had lots of things that none of our competitors had because our profitability was high. Our profitability, we could afford to do those things because we were spending, I was really focused on listing business development. So profit drives, <laughs> profit allows you to do all those things. Which there, it, it's a full comes full circle. Then it allows you to deliver even better customer service. So uh, the hardest thing is just that first. It's like your first year of law school. You know, that's the toughest year. Your first year of dental school. That's the toughest year. Your first year in real estate. Getting this engine going is the toughest thing. So kind of keep that in mind when you're spending all the hours and, and listening to all these sellers. You know, tell you no, and and all the rejection that you have to deal with, because that's part of it. You have to go through that before you get to that next level. It sounds like Gary Keller's three L's of real estate: leads, listings, leverage. Right. Yeah. And the, it, leveraging your time. That is, it's that is that's it. It's about leveraging your time, and and it's <clears throat> the hardest thing is most realtors just don't get to that point. Once you get to that point. I mean, I could spend, I was never in Dallas the month of August. I was in Europe or I was somewhere else. And you can do that and you can, you can, you can deliver better customer service. Or me, I expected my staff to deliver better service than I did because that was their full-time job. So that was, my expectations were really high there as far as the customer service that we delivered. So don't, don't feel like you have to be there. Or you're the one that has to do, do all of this. You know, I, I never... Uh, it, that's that's where the luxury business is different. When you're in luxury real estate, it's not like that. Yeah, I mean, I have friends in luxury real estate. David Nichols, I have a friend that works for him, Faisal Hallam. Faisal's in, in Greece right now, and David can't stand it because David, I mean, he is the, the team leader, and, and David never takes off. He never takes off more than three days at a time. He went to Carmel last week for a week. It's the first time he's ever done it. He's 60-something years old. I mean, he is very, very disciplined, but his average sales price is over a million dollars. So those clients expect that. And that's where you guys have the luxury of if you're focused on kind of a bread and butter type, more of a, a moderate sales price, then that client, they just expect good service. You know, they just want value. They want professionalism. And they don't <clears> care who gives it to them. So it's, it's a lot different than the luxury market. So it actually gives you more advantages, I think, and that's the reason that I chose to go to build my team the way I did versus David or other luxury brokers in the business. And I get that question a lot. Some people ask about increasing their average sales price. A lot of these real estate traders will say, we'll just focus on increasing your average sales price. And that's great to a certain point, but it varies market to market depending on what market you're in. Yes. Right, yeah. Um, so the evolution of a team. The, the last thing you ever want to delegate is the listing process. You want to delegate the listing management, servicing that listing. And a lot of this is in those Mike Ferry, you know, 18 CDs. He talks about a lot of these things, and, I, and this is where I learned it myself, too. And I, the last person I trained on my team was my listing specialist. I had, I had a personal assistant, I had an evaluation assistant, 
I had someone that did prospecting. I had someone that did um, contracts or contract manager. I had, I mean, a lot of other components of the team, but the listing specialist, and I spent almost a year training that person. She went out on two, three appointments a day with me until she was trained because that's the toughest thing. And that's, again, what we're going to talk about today. It's the same things that I trained her on is what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is that listing presentation. And a lot of that listing presentation is your valuation skills. So that's okay. Okay. Back to the Gary Kell book, you would always recommend that you hire a buyer's agent after your assistant for a buyer's agent and eventually listing agent. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to offload that. I think I had four or five buyer's agents before I brought on a listing specialist. Um, so your listing pre qualification is, uh, well, lead generator. Uh, the lead generation is number one, and you, know, you got to have the leads before you start pre-qualifying leads. <laughs> so that's why your prospecting skills are so important. You know, developing the systems, using the Mojo Power Dotter, having your direct mail pieces in place, having your postcards in place or your uh, flyers in place. You know, you're marketing your area that you're going to market, your open houses, doing those open houses every week to where people just can't get away from you. You know, people think that you are everywhere all the time. You know, and that was something that. Every time I listed a house, there were flyers. I put flyers around. I did it myself. I just put tape on the door and a black. I didn't even put print color. I did black and white flyers, and I did it around 100 to 200 around every property I listed or sold. And so people couldn't get away from me. And then I was also prospecting on the phone, and that was back before we had the technology we have now. And so now we could, we've got, and I provide that for you guys for free to where you can do that. And you can use these power dialers, and that's that's a huge benefit. And then the distribution, you know, that's we have a couple agents that pay a distribution company. I used to do it myself when I was an agent because I kind of like getting out there as well. And I was doing condo townhome. Condo townhome, I could hit, you know, in three days in a month, I could get my 5,000 flyers out. To where, when you're doing houses that are more spread out, it's tough to do that. So I would probably, if I were you in your areas, use a uh, a distribution service to where we can get that pricing down to 10 cents each for each flyer. And something else that you'll want to do is take advantage of Gracie's social uh, media uh, marketing on how to present that value proposition to the small business owner. So that way you can have them absorb that cost. So if you're putting a printing a coupon on the back or if you're putting something on the back of that, that mail piece that's promoting a small business that you endorse, and you're also you have a discount of a service that they're providing, and it, the discount needs to be either buy one get one free or something that's a 20% or greater of value. You know you can't get consumer buy-in until you have something 20% greater of value or buy one get one free. And so restaurants, spa services, you know things that are pretty generic that everyone has to use are things that you want to promote. Um, so that Gracia has that training and. That's something there again. I always wanted to do when I was an agent, but I was so busy I barely had time to even get my flyers out every month, much less negotiate discounts mm -hmm. with the vendors. So that's why we want to have this in place for you guys. You can take advantage of some of the things that I couldn't when I was an agent or I didn't have time to take advantage of. So lead generation is number one. You know that and that goes back to that mindset: seventy percent listing business development. Number two is lead follow up, and that's where that ties into your you have to have some type of a system, whether it's conversion or whether it's Outlook or Top Producer, to where you have all of your leads in there and you know you're, you have reminders that pop up of when you need to call them, when you need to follow up, what you need to say, and you need to have a newsletter that goes out to everyone, all your 5,000 people, about once a month. Now, this is where those Monday calls are so important because my broker told me the same thing 15 years ago when I got my license was you know, send a newsletter out to everyone in your area. Well, you know, I was licking stamps and, and licking envelopes and spending a lot of money on it. And I didn't get any, you know, return any bang for my buck. So I don't want you guys to do that. I want you guys to, to see what's working, what's not working, and an electronic delivery on a newsletter that has good content. And we provide that for you as well. This Altos research to where you can really drill down that's valuable content to these homeowners that are in their area so that way they can input their zip code, they get it electronically and it will give them information relative to what's going on in their neighborhood. 
know, no one wants some generic information that they could read about in the Dallas Morning News or USA Today. They want some. They want to know what their neighbor's house sold for. They want to know, you know, what was something stolen, you know, from the neighbor's house last week, or is there a garage sale going on this weekend for a fundraiser drive? And things are really relative to that. So keep that in mind. Um, so that that system where there's something they're being contacted every 30 days, and then um, so that that ties into your lead follow up, and then your listing pre-qualifications. That's the thing that we want to talk about is pre-qualifying that listing and that listing pre-qualification form. It's a one-page form that I used. My assistant would call with those questions before we would go out on the appointment. We would not go out on the appointment until those questions were answered. And then your listing appointment itself and then um, the next phase is servicing the listing and then closing. And once you can afford an assistant, then they can do that. You know, I would always go to closing, but the assistant would usually, I mean, they did everything. I didn't really touch it from when I took that listing. I'd bring the file in, give it to the assistant, and then they, you know, put had the sign put out on a box and everything else. So um, <clears throat> that's, that's where we want to get you. So a lot of that takes practice. You know, practice on your lead. When it starts, it all starts with the lead generation. That's why these Monday calls, the number of contacts you make is where it starts. You know, on the phone, what are you saying to these people? And to get those contacts to turn into appointments or turn into actually leads, really. You gotta have a lead before you have an appointment. So then get those turned into leads, and then so many of those leads are going to turn into appointments. And then you're going to pre qualify. So now that I want to spend some time on the actual. Um, pre-qualification process because that is that is the most important. So there's there's several things that you can use. You can use the Mike Ferry listing pre-qualifying the listing script. So the script, the one page script page that I use is basically a variation of this. And I used it for years with my team and my assistant would call. So the number one question, this is the question I've Tell you guys a lot to, to ask. If there's nothing else that you ask, then this is the one thing you need to know the answer to. And that is, before I come out, there's a number of questions I need to ask you. Is that okay? If what I say makes sense and you feel comfortable and confident that I can sell your home, are you planning to list your home with me when I come out tomorrow evening at five? And it's a that's a powerful question. That's a strong question, and it's not, it's not always easy to ask. But what do they have to give you an objection, or they have to say? I mean, it's it's so direct, it flushes out a lot of problems. And what happens is, if you don't ask that question, there's a thousand things that can come up at that listing appointment to where they 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 didn't bother to tell you. You know, like well, Mary Jane was out here yesterday, and she um, she has this. Um, this sign, it's a talking sign, and the talking sign will alert her immediately whenever there's a, and yours yours doesn't cover that, so we're going to use Mary Jane, you know. Well, of course you have that. We have a conversion system with the text and the, the QR code, but you can't go over everything with it. I mean, so that's why asking them that question flushes out lots and lots of things. Or you may get out to the listing appointment and they say, well, you know, my husband really needs to be here, so I'm going to go over this with my husband. Or <laughs> There's no way that you can anticipate what could possibly be an objection. So that's why this question is so important. And then number two, are you planning on interviewing more than one agent for the job of selling your home? And then we would take that a step further, um, which I was looking for that form. Richard, did you print that out? Or? I sent you an email. I don't have it. Oh, okay. Well, I sent it to you. Do you mind... Um, Send it to me today. Yeah, a few minutes ago. If you can just print out, I'll, I'll go over it. But basically, it just says, um, if you, what agent are you planning on interviewing? And then you can find out who your competition is. Because you don't want to get out there and then, then say, well, we're also, we've also talked to so and so, and um, she's a friend of the family. So that's who we're. Just, we just felt like we needed a second opinion, so thanks for coming out. <laughs> so, and that's those are the things you want to eliminate. And so, if you know who so and so is, if it's Aunt Aunt Jane, 
and Aunt Jane sold one house last year, then how do you think, how confident do you think they're going to feel in Aunt Jane after you show them that and you print out Aunt Jane's MLS stats? Because we always did that. We would always print out our competition. And so that way when we went out on the appointment and they say, well, I'm interviewing so-and-so and I'm interviewing so-and-so, then we would pull out pull their stats and we can do that. So you we that's a, on the broker level. So you have to let either Gracia or Erica or myself know or Richard and then we can pull a report on that other agent. And who knows, it may be a top producer in the area. And that top producer may have sold twenty homes and maybe you sold one. So that there again, you need to ask me or Richard on how you deal with that. I guarantee that top producer also had more listings expire than you did. So you pull how many listings that top producer didn't sell because we pull that as well. So this is, you know, that's where you've got to get us involved so that we can help you on these things. Um, okay. That was the only one of my questions because, you know, obviously being new, right. I've done zero of them. Right. So, so you've had a lot, so you, you've had a lot fewer listings expire and not sell than, you know, Mary Jane, top producer. So, um, as a professional real estate agent, I study homes and prices every day. Therefore, I single list with me at a price that will cause your home to sell. Correct? Now that's that's a, they're getting a pretty strong question, <laughs> and I can't remember if we phrased it like that or not. I think um, I don't think we asked that. I think I just asked what you know, um, how much do you want to list your home for, and I would find out up front. And it's always important to know if they have an idea of what they want for their house before you go out because then you know how much work you've got in front of you you know how much negotiating how much educating how how soft are they going to be or receptive to your price because you don't want to walk out there with an over, walk out of that listing with an overpriced listing and this market prices are moving up at a pace that it's less of a concern than it would be in other markets but it's something you need to know before you go out there because you want, may want to spend, if they say, if they had some unrealistic amount, then maybe you need to show them all the homes that haven't sold at that price in their area. You know, maybe you need to show them the properties that have been on the market for over 90 days and educate them on how that could hurt them if their home is one of those that's aged house where that's not, that's on the market a long time without selling. So you, you know how much time also you're going to have to spend on the valuation piece. If they give you a price that's under market or a price that's a motivated price, and you know, well, you know, I won't have to spend very much time on my CMA. I won't have to spend very much time on my so that because the CMA with an unrealistic seller can take up to 30 minutes on their own educating them on all that. A CMA was the motivated seller or a seller that maybe they're just more educated. Maybe they just know. Maybe they had an appraisal done, and you know, this is the price and decided and it's a very competitive price. Then you don't have to spend as much time on it. But you want to know before you go out there. Um, how much do you on the, owe on the property? And that's that's important to know, especially when we were doing these five, six years ago, because so many people were upside down. So this is less important now, but it's still an important question to ask because if they are upside down, you need to know, and that way you can call them and ask them about their bank. You know, do they have a first loan and a second loan? What's the probability of a short sale? A whole series of questions on qualifying them for the short sale, and then. Um, Number seven, have you thought about selling it for yourself? Okay, so this is this is a variation. This is the one that I had kind of I had inserted for my assistant because my assistant is the one that would call and ask this, go through this. And so that's why I actually qualified these with what their answers had to be. <laughs> Otherwise I wasn't going on that appointment. And I didn't want to waste waste the job, waste the time of my listing specialist either. So I I had kind of tweaked this. Um, so number one, if what Logan says makes sense and you feel comfortable and confident we can sell your home, are you planning to list your home with us when we come out on Tuesday at 5? Yes. Okay. Are you planning to interview more than one Jay for the job? See, we, I just took this verbatim from Mike Ferry. Um, refer to objection handlers if they still say yes, refer to Logan. Great. We'd like to prepare a comparison of our production and theirs to give you an objective comparison and ask you who the other agents are so we can gather their statistics from the MLS. So that is just standard practice. Yeah, we always do that. Tell me again where are you moving to? Great. How soon do you have to be there? You know, I 
also want to make sure it's less than four months. Uh, when we see you, how much do you want to list your home for? As a okay, see, I basically copied just verbatim um, to do to be determined by CMA and condition to market value. So I would have my assistant always prepared the CMA before I went out. So I had that with me, and it was actually this form was stapled to. Um, in fact, you can see at the top, this was for my staff because this needed to be checked and stapled to the, the CMA in my listing agreement. Um, have you ever thought about selling it yourself? Okay. And would you briefly describe your home for me? Any recent updates? If so, when? Now this, we actually had another form on the back that had a, a lot of different items. So it would have, you know, how old is the roof? Have you had any claims on the roof? Some other questions to ask. And those are the questions that you'll learn as you are doing this longer as far as conditions. So because we drilled down, we spent a lot of time on that question number eight on describing the house for me because um, so many people were upside down. And we wanted to make sure if their home had deferred maintenance that we knew about it before we went out there. And if, they, if it was too bad, then we didn't want to spend our, waste our time. It, number nine, is your home ready to be listed or have you considered repairs or updates before listing? So that's something that's also an important question to ask, and that is because you would know, okay, do I need to get a pre-listing agreement signed or, or basically a pre-dated listing agreement and help them with contractors and uh, repair people? And for you guys, especially as new agents, I would really encourage you to ask that as well because that way you can ask us or you can have resources when you go out there. If they say, well, I need to get some painting done, I probably need to get the carpets cleaned, I need to get this done, then you'll have a list of people before you go out on that appointment that you can just say, okay, you know, this is the person for the carpets, this is the person for painting. Because the more, the more people that you re refer them, then the more value they see in your services, then the, the better probability your chances are of listing that. Okay, number 10, we'll be sending over a package of information in a brief CMA. Will you take a few moments and review it? And they may say, well, you know, I'm not going to have time, or, um, you know, we would send it within 24 hours. So if that listing appointment was in two days, and they said, well, I'm not going to have time to review it, that we would move the appointment. You know, well, we want to make sure you have time. Would you rather have more time? Would you rather take a look at it um, tomorrow? And then we scheduled to meet on Friday. And because that was that was the reason we always ask that question. And then there's some people they just they're not going to look at it, <laughs> but at least you've had that conversation with them. Um, we'll touch base with you again before we come out, and you've had a chance to review the CMA. So see, that was a key question for us, and that was because so many people were upside down. So this is one of the things that's not. Um, yeah, this is not on the Mike Ferry, but we, you know. Through going out on 50 or 80 appointments and not getting them, we started adding this kind of stuff. Um, so it's almost like a, an additional pre-qualification call. <laughs> um, and then my listing specialist would call, that was Kathy, Kathy to call. I want to make sure you receive the CMA, we seen that yesterday, and see if you have any questions. Are you comfortable listing between the range of values suggested on the CMA? Um, and we, so we already, we basically pre-negotiated that listing. I mean, there's no reason for them not to sign. When we went out there, that's why our closing rate was so high. Just so you know, your meeting with Logan should only take between 25 minutes and 45 minutes. Okay. And then we put the time, date, you know, information that's on the form. Okay. So that's, if there's nothing else that you guys take away today, that Waller Group seller appointment form is so important because Especially, I think, even more important when you're a new agent because you can you can then be prepared so that way you can ask Richard or ask myself different things that, that show up in this through their answers because if you get there and you're ready to sign the listing and then they start talking about these things, then it's, it's like, okay, well, what, you know, now I've got to come back out. or And that's the other thing you want to do. You want to make sure there's no – you isolate every objection. So then – um, sometimes I think we would even go back to number one and we would even go back and ask it again. So, you know, if you're comfortable with this range of value of, you know, 180 to 195 based on our CMA, 
are you um, going to move forward with the listing on Logan at seven, you know, on Thursday? And they, you know, they, they by then they've already looked over our marketing package, our pre-listing package. They've already seen the CMA. They know where we're going to market the home. They've seen our marketing plan. And so why not? You know, and the um, they may say, well, you know, it depends on Mary Claire. And Mary Claire, you know, I, I promised her an interview and I promised to meet with her. So that's that's fine. You know, Mr. Seller will call and take care of that. And we'll let her know that you've chosen him to list with us. Would you be right? Right. Are you comfortable with that? You know, it's a very non. Anytime you'd say, "Are you comfortable with that?" You know, or does that make sense? Is that fair? Nod your head. You know, it's a subliminal messaging. You're nodding your head to that consumer. So that the more you do that, then the more open they are with you, and you're pre-closing already. You're getting ready for that signature. That's all a form of closing. So that's um, that's going to be real important. So now let's talk about the actual listing presentation itself. And so that that's why if the if the CMA is completed properly and your appointment form or prequal form script is completed properly, the listing presentation it's like they, it sells itself. You know, there's not really that much else to do. And so when we went out on the listing presentation, it was more of getting the market or getting the property market ready. Most of the value that we had when we would go out there are suggestions on how we could get the top side of that price. You know, what is we could do to get the, the maximum value? Yes. I would like to add on that uh, pre-call uh, for the appointment. Questions eight and nine are really key on being able to get a good value on your CMA because knowing what they're needing and repairs, what upgrades they've already done, things like that are really the biggest variables that yeah. can affect your CMA value that you don't see on the market analysis of the homes in the area. Yeah, right? and another thing that we found a lot is people will say, "Oh yeah, we just we." Uh, we completely redid the kitchen, and we completely upgraded all of our baths, all of our bathrooms, and um, so the plumbing is, you know, we redid that. We also replaced the pool. Okay, well, what year did you? Well, it was 1983, we redid the kitchen. In 1990, we replaced the pool. <laughs> it's like people forget how long, and, and so that's where you have to actually ask, okay, well, what year? And that was another thing that was a question on our form. So when you have newer homes, it's not such a big deal. But when you have people that are 60, 70, you know, depending on what areas you're marketing in, those are key, key questions. Um, Can I answer? Yes. I, I always ask them, especially if it's been recent, if it's been recent within the last two to three years, five years, do you still have invoices for all the things that you did implement into the home because that's going to help them assess value at a greater amount compared to the one down the street? Right. And I do that, and I get them every time on that one. Yeah. Because nobody else asked for it. Yeah. And that's and sometimes they'll say, "Well, oh, I spent all of this, you know, money," and um, they think they can get it all back. Uh, but that's where you have to show them until you have that conversation. You actually compare. Well, here's a house down the street, and, and I looked at it just like a friend of mine. I don't really do sales now, but he's. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, and, and so he wants to list his place at the W and buy something in Allen uh, Park. And you know, I'm kind of out of the market. I haven't really looked, so I had to actually go and preview and look at a lot of the competition there at the W to see what else is on the market, what he's competing with. And I told him, Jeff, you know, I know you spent with your designer, you know, three hundred fifty thousand on redoing this place, but you're only going to be able to get about one hundred fifty, one hundred eighty back out of it. So, and that's where. I think it's important to offer them the property management or offering them the option of rent. And I still I tell my friends this, and I would tell any seller this today, is that don't sell unless you have to. The market's going up. I mean, one of the best investments you can have is residential income properties right now. So especially when you've got it, probably they've got a really good interest rate on their loan. So unless they just need their cash out to buy, to move up, then they need to hold on to that property. And they appreciate that honest advice too. And it gives them an option. The more times you give them an option, then the higher probability your closing rate is going to be as well. Um, okay, so we, we have the Mike Ferry one minute presentation. And that is, 
you know, do you mind if I take a quick look at your home? I wrote down three real important questions. Do you absolutely have to sell? Fantastic. Will you price your home to sell? Or do you want to keep it on the market for a long period of time? And do you want me to handle the sale for you? So I used to role play this over and over and over. I can remember hours and hours. Um, all we need to do now is simply sign the contract so I can help you get what you want in the time you want. Won't that be great? So this, I role I was 22. I didn't know the difference. I role play this all the time. But the reality is this is really for um, personal referrals or you know your mom, some, someone that's going to list with you just regardless. So I would... I would go through the full presentation when it's a expired listing or someone that's in your area, where especially where you may be competing for that listing. So why did you keep that in there? Do what? Why did you keep the one minute? You want to share with them? Oh, the one minute. Well, Mike Ferry said the less realtors talk, the better the <laughs> better odds are of getting the listing. So, and that sounds so ludicrous, you know. And we all laugh at that, but yet. It reaffirms this business. This is a relationship-based business. People people buy from people they like, and people. That's why the face-to-face -face communication is so important. That's why that relationship component is so important, and that's what took me years to figure out in this business. But Gary Keller said it every every you know. It's one of the reasons I'm so focused on building this brokerage because that component will never go away from residential real estate. And so that's kind of our, all of our job security. Um, my houses online. Right, yeah, it's the biggest purchase they'll ever make. Yeah. You know, people don't buy even cars online, hardly. So uh, to buy houses online, it's not, it's it's very rare. We used to see, I think it was Realty Bid, it was an auction platform, online auction platform, that even at the top of the, at the REO market, seven or eight years ago, Realty Bid, they could not, the success rate was only 20% on those people that would bid online. And um, online bidding is, we see it with the auction today, the auction processes today, we do see a lot of online bidding, but that doesn't work without the open house component. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every one of those, those people are going, it. yeah, they want to see it. They're going through those open houses. So, yeah. Right, yeah. Too many, too many variables. Exactly. So the CMA presentation, so, um, at the end of my presentation tonight, one of three things will happen. You'll have the opportunity to list your home with me, or I'll just, you'll decide not to list your home with me, or I'll decide not to take the listing. Anyone is fine. Although that's also, I didn't personally, I did not ask those questions. I didn't think I saw value in them. But the importance of this number four on the presentation is setting their expectation. Setting their expectation is extremely important. So that's part of having a rehearsed presentation. That's part of having... You know, using canned scripts, the value in those things is that you're you're setting that expectation, you're following the format, and that that conveys professionalism. It conveys knowledge that you know your you know that you know your stats. So even if you set that expectation with something else, you know we're going to go through three parts right now. I'm going to show you how the statistics in your area are relative to the sale of this home. I'm also going to show you what an appraiser would do because financing, we, no matter what price you think you can get for your house, most people have to have a loan. So if we can't get financing on it, then we're knocking out 80% of the buyers. Do you see how that's important to make sure that we're, we're, we can compete? You know, Asking them that question, they have to give you buy-in. So that's, that comes with your presentation and this is, you know, this is a Mike Ferry generic presentation. But if you want to customize it to your own, like we did, that's fine too. But just make sure you are following the presentation. Um, let's take a, quickly take a moment and review the questions I asked you over the phone. You said you're moving to blank, right? You said you were moving because, right? You said you had to be there by blank. So this is again part of your presentation. You're reaffirming so that this is. There's a lot of subliminal messaging in this too. You're pre-closing. So this is part of your close. You're getting them comfortable. These are closing, uh, working them closer to the close. And you said you owe X, right? Now you were planning on selling it yourself, okay? And you did want your money out. Now, did I go through that? No, I didn't ask all of those questions. But we did ask. We did ask. I think the the top three or four, you know, where they're moving to. We'd go over a lot of the things that we've mentioned in that pre-call presentation. 
Now, there are only two issues we have to look at tonight. Number one, your motivation to sell this home, and number two, the price we set in your home. I don't think I went through that either. I, I did tell them I went over to appraisal, the value you know, of what, why it's important to price their property in line with how an appraiser would, and I would spend some time on the appraisal process. I've prepared what we call a comparative market analysis, um, fantasy land and reality. I didn't really go into that. The purpose of the CMA is to determine the value of your home in the eyes of buyer. Do you know how buyers determine value? Now that's it. This is important because this is basically comparison shopping. You know, you are showing them, and you're comparison shopping. And this is just like my friend, you know, a couple weeks ago with the W condo. I said, Jeff, you know, I looked at another unit. It's priced at seven ninety five, and it's even though you spent all this money on yours. It's five floors above yours. You know, you're on the seventh floor, and it's on the twelfth floor, and it's there's no way we could ask more for yours. So even though yours is much much nicer, just because of the floor location, we can't go over seven ninety five. You know? more desirable with this All right, it's comparison shopping, so they can't argue with that. Um, Buyers determine value by comparison shopping. They look at your price of your home based on its features and benefits and compare it with the features and benefits of similar homes. So that's where the photos and you know kitchens and baths, knowing your market, and this is where not just telling them things, you don't want to tell them, but you want to demonstrate in the eyes of a buyer. You know, some of the buyers, most of the buyers I work with, this is what they've said, or and that's why these the for sale by owner program is so effective, that for sale by owner script, because you're actually describing what buyers are looking at, what buyers have seen. And when you can speak from the perspective of a buyer, it provides a lot more validity and a lot more value and they can they understand it. They're much more receptive than if you go in as just the market expert and and, uh, and don't give a, a story or a demonstration based on a buyer. Well, it's like my son. I can tell them all day something, but as soon as somebody else tells them, it's cold. Right. right. Yeah. You know, I mean, Third party validation. That's called selective hearing. <laughs> well, no, he hears me, but he refuses to listen until. Yeah, you know, the next coach he goes, Dad, he said do this. I said, Right. I just told right. You. And third party you know, validation is also plays into your Zillow reviews, your Trulia reviews. A lot of these online reviews that are becoming a lot more prevalent, prevalent with um, agent selection. So keep that in mind as well. It's a whole other you know, class. But um, okay, so unless you're planning on adding more features or benefits to your home, price is the only issue. Can I show you what I mean? And then you actually explain the baths, the bedrooms, square footage, the neighborhood. Have you seen this house? This is I I forgot about this, but this is an important question. Have you seen this house? I never asked that, but that's where I would just assume that they have it. But I think that may be a good idea to go ahead and ask them that. And of course, they haven't seen that house, or most of the time they haven't. Um, but if you have and you've previewed that, then they're again you have a lot more validity. Or tamed the house. Right. That's what I do. Yeah, that's a great. That's that is common. Sometimes if you have a seller that's that's a stickler on price, or they just taking them that listing, that's a great idea. Um, based on the features and benefits of the home, tell them you're, you know, comparison shopping again. Um, Okay, so what price? So you're leading. You're asking them leading questions. Question 14: What price do you feel we should use to create value in the eyes of the buyer and get someone to decide to buy your home versus the competition? So you have to get them in that buyer's mindset to where they're thinking from the mindset of the buyer, and they may have to spend five or ten minutes actually walking through these other active comps or walking through the active comps and seeing what those look like before you get them in that mindset. And then that's a that's a real killer question. What price do you feel we should use? Now that you've seen these these prices, I would recommend a price of, you know, and I usually I'd say a range of value, you know, and I would always qualify that. And that's something that's not on these scripts, but I learned the hard way it's really important. And that is, you know, Mr. Ms. Buyer, I mean seller, this price can change tomorrow. If the neighbor Fire sales that are listing and they put it on the market at twenty thousand under ours. I could be spending ten thousand a month, you know, have your home on every billboard in town, and their house is going to sell first. That's just the reality. So, does that you know does that make sense? Well, of course. So, and say that's part of my job is to inform you of when there is a change, if 
if in case we need to reposition your home on the market. I would always use that terminology, reposition the home, the price. Um, so some of these uh, are it's how to deal with that price. Now, that's, that's, those are the two most important components of your listing presentation, and that is the um, pre-qualifying the listing, actually lead generation, <laughs> because if you have enough leads, then you can, you know, five, five appointments a day was always my mantra with my prospecting, my person that was prospecting in our lead generation efforts. We had multi-pronged lead generation efforts. And so that was always the goal, five appointments a day. We may have only gone out on two or three appointments a day, but that was the goal in order to get those, those daily listing appointments. And, but, and it, I knew if there was enough of them, then if they weren't motivated, if they were upside down, if they weren't cooperative, if they didn't appreciate our marketing plan, then you know there's another one to go to. So it didn't, didn't affect me. Um, and that's, so that's real important. Number one out of all this is lead generation. So then, um, pre-qualifying that listing, which we talked about that, using that one-page listing pre-qualification form, and then your listing presentation. And the pricing, when you're out there, that pricing, what we just did going through that, is, is pretty much the most important. So now, they have, you know, you've got them comfortable with price, and you always want to address that first, move that out of the way before you close them on the listing agreement. So, now we're going to go through the listing agreement, and what I would do is the our seller's guide. I would, you know, I'd already have sent that to them, so they've already had a chance to look through that. And usually, that's when I would ask them, and did you have a chance to look through the seller's guide? Did you have any questions? And a lot of times there would be certain questions. You know, well, um, we don't want an open house, and I see that you're planning on doing an open house. That's fine. You know, you know, we don't have to do an open house. Um, we don't want a lot box on our door because we just don't want strangers coming in here all the time. Well, we have an electronic key box, so that way we track everyone that comes in. The centralized showing service also registers that agent, and the agents are, um, they have a, generally what's customary is a two-hour time frame, so if that's comfortable. And so we, normally those were the kind of questions that we would get when we asked them if they had any questions on our seller's guide. Um, and then let's let's now talk, the, what's the biggest commit, objection we get? Usually it's commission. And that's where we would go through and we would ask them on the um, on the commission platform, you know, which which would they like? The six, seven, or eight percent on the commission. And the back then guaranteed sale had a, a stronger pull. You know, now guaranteed sale is not a big deal. Now you're going to get more. And we honestly, we didn't get very much commission pushback. Um, I did a lot of expired listings, so these were people that they just wanted professional service delivered right, and they were not. You know, the commission back then it was so hard to sell a house that the six percent commission was not a problem at all. We never had a problem with that. Now you're going to continue to get more and more pushback on your commission, so be prepared for that. So there's there's ways to get creative with that, um, and one of the one of the things you know a common one of the one of the things I think is so important about having your marketing plan is um, that's the way you to me that's the way you defend your commission. You know, it's like we're doing all these things to market your property, and this, these are. And I had a huge staff. You know, it's like you're getting the 18 people for the price of one. So that's where you can go in. You can actually show our org chart. You know, we have someone that's that's does signs and lock boxes. Garrett, he's full time out putting out signs. Lock. It's a lot of money. You know, I've got we've got people that are doing data entry and they're doing marketing, and it's a you know, this is this costs a lot of money to facilitate all of this. Oh, and the marketing, the online marketing that we're doing, the Trulia and Zillow, and all the upgrades and the enhancements, Homes.com. I mean, that's all. It's just expensive to execute all of that. So, you know, what is it that you'd want us to cut out if we were to discount our commission? And that's where you know that usually they, there wasn't anything that they wanted cut out. So. And that was that was a question I would ask, but that's where I want your feedback. I want to know what 
what you're getting as far as pushback and when they say, well, you know, I just so and so normally what they're gonna say is, well, Aunt Jane, she said she'd do it for four and a half percent or five percent. So, you know, would you match that? Well, that's where I would show my stats. Well, Aunt Jane, only forty percent of her listings have sold. So you will do do you want a ninety percent chance of selling your home or do you want a forty percent chance of selling your home? I mean it's up to you. It's just I I think it's like what I always say, you get what you pay for. So you can you can decide. And usually they, they don't they don't want to take a risk. You know, they're not especially and that's where sometimes I may have to educate them more, you know, okay, we're moving into a slower market. Here we are in September. November is usually the slowest marketing season of the year, the slowest sales season of the year going into the holidays. So if someone's not spending the money to properly market your home, you could be sitting on your home until next spring. Is that a risk that you want to take? You know, I, w I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't make you aware of that. And that's where the, it's, it, a lot of it is educating them. So they need to know why you know, they need to use you. So, um, so going over the marketing plan, I think it's an important process. And then something else that's important, and this is where if you're competing with a top producer or someone else, actually showing them, you know, you know, that this is, I think, a real powerful sheet, and that's why we put it at the back of the presentation, that you don't want to risk listing with the wrong agents. Uh, did you know, now we probably need to revise this number. This was back when the market was not as good, but only 58% of the listings are sold with the first agent. And you can tell, you know, to say this, this information, we probably need to update this because this is a better market now. But this does give you just some, um, our group, we sold, you know, the property was on the market with us for this many days, and yet if this many days with these other agents. So you said the other agents with Keller Williams, didn't you? Now here's Keller Williams. It looks like they, this property on Shabella, we sold it in 17 days, and Keller Williams had it for 71 days, and it never sold. And you said the other agent you're interviewing was with Remax, right? Okay. It was, sorry, I'm sorry. Looks like Remax had it on the market after 181 days. This house on Temple Cliff, we sold it in the 18. I just kind of did the handle like that. <laughs> it, it, normally they closed themselves. It wasn't an issue. But it's something I always like to point out because I thought it was important showing um, it, it, the more doubt you create with your competitor, then the more that helps you as well. And you can't create that doubt unless you know your numbers and you know your competition. And then just going through, you know, I would just do the assumptive close, go through the listing. We, my assistant would already have a listing uh, agreement prepared, so I would just start initialing it and put in. I'd ask them on the price, and then on the days and on the showings, I'd start talking about the, um, you know, do you have certain times that you don't want the property shown, and what phone numbers do you want for CSS? I'd have the CSS form there to complete as well. Uh, it's a one-page form, so that way it's entered with CSS. CSS lately has had a lot of problems. Their staff is not as good lately. So uh, what I would do is I would put it with CSS and then call to make sure, test them to make sure, set up a preview uh, for probably the MLS tour when you have it on your next MLS tour. Make sure they get the show instructions right because they goof up a lot. Um, and then the let them know, okay, the sign we're going to place tomorrow, or if you're putting out the sign lot box or we've got someone else doing it. So we provide that as a service for you guys. We can do that. I think it's $120. We'll do all the paperwork, put it in, in Maestro, put out the sign in the lockbox, take the photos, take the measurements. You also, if you're going to do all that yourself, then be sure to bring that Netris uh, sheet that has all the fields. So that way you can, while you're there, you're measuring all the rooms. And for $30 at Home Depot, you can buy those electronic laser measures. It's a necessity for everyone. So... Um, and then you go through, you want to go ahead and set the appointment for the photos. If you're going to have a professional photographer come out, shoot to sell is one of the better professional photographers for 100 bucks to do your photography. And that's, you know, say 72 hours, three to five days, you know, where you have everything ready to photograph if we schedule it for this day. And I would just start getting them prepared on the scheduling. You know, that's also part of your clothes. And... Now let's let's go over some objections. Let's say we're about out of time, but let's say they 
what are some common objections other than commission, but that they won't list with you that time or that that time that you're with them? Um, Got to think it over. Okay. That's right. So that's why that there again, that pre call form is so important. They've already seen your seller's guide, your marketing plan. You've sent them that pre listing package with this. They've already seen your um, CMA. We used to, as a team, we always send CMA over so that way they could look at that or they were we would, on the phone, make sure they're comfortable with that range of value. So, what is there to think over? You know, I mean, really, there's not anything. So, um, and that end, um, if you follow the form and ask that question, if you're comfortable with everything that Logan says when he comes out, will you list your home this, at this time? Then there's, I rarely ever received that objection of, well, we have to think it over. Because we'd already, we'd already closed them on that form, if not once, twice. What are some other objections that, well, what if I wait till the spring? You know, the spring selling See, season. This, this is when I'm, I just dealt with this. Yeah. Guy, somebody referred me to the guy. Mm -hmm. Perfect scenario. I mean, I said, see him in the morning and I'm walking out to the house. I'm doing a pool because I've got new property signs. Right. I just got a great marketing presentation right. on the back end. Showed him everything that I was going to do. He's like, oh, I'll wait. It's going to be great. I, I, I called the stager saying, okay, I need y'all to come do this, that, and other. And I'll we go look for the builders. We go to some of the builder right. locations that were relative to his area. I've already told him who I am. And he used to build houses up at the city. So he knows it all too. And so we know that thing said, we get all the way through that. And then all of a sudden, he just, I mean, he just like, pushed the brakes quick. He said, you know, I think I just want to wait until next spring. And I said, well, that's fine if you want to do that. However, you're missing out on a lot of buyers. It could potentially purchase. Okay, so why why is it you want to wait though? I said it during my life. Um, I mean, he's a single guy. Right. He said he's he's got a flip up in up in Oklahoma City that he needs right. to finish. Okay. I mentioned because of the location he's at. Right. I, I could sell it five days. I think that's what I'm now, I, I, know I, I went on a listing appointment last year with an agent here, and uh, and we did not get the listing because they were worried we'd sell too fast. <laughs> and so, I, the first time I'd ever had that happen. But um, and the agent didn't have the listing agreement prepared when we went out there. You know, we could have if she would have been prepared, we we would have been able to flush that out and there at the appointment. That's why you want to be prepared. You don't want to walk out of there unless you have that secret sign. Um, okay, so you can always offer a lease back. Right. I did. I even said that. Did you ask me that question number four? I said you have to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 That I had the ability to help him achieve in a very short amount of time, and I think that's what. Proved so you're probably working with one of the more challenging sellers, someone that wants to downsize in this market. So um, what I would do is just educate them. You want to educate them as much as possible. What interest rates are moving up? So you know if you and then what? Why is it that you want to downsize? You want to go back to that emotion, that emotional. Real estate purchases are emotional. I mean, I'm a pretty value conscious person. I always thought they're um, based on value, but most of them are emotional purchases. So even if they say, well, I want to downsize to save money and say then then you want them, you want to start leading them to look at, okay, what is it that they're, how much is it that they're going to save? You're going to help them through that process. Okay. Um, you see your maintenance, how much are you spending on maintenance and long care, insurance on this house, you know, what's the scenario with another one that you would save money on? And then maybe gas or, you know, help them kind of a cost benefit analysis, work them through that scenario. And then the the other thing that I would consider is I would I would always be you always want to focus on that move. You know, if they're moving to Detroit Let's get you with a referral agent in Detroit. I want to get you, when are you going up there? I want to make sure that you're scheduled with this other agent so that way we can find you the right house. And you, since it is an emotional decision, then where they're moving, you always want to keep their eye on the ball. 
and not where they're coming from. You want them to, to lose the attachment, the emotional attachment they have to this house, the equity that they have in the house, all the repairs that they've made, all the, the, the what's happened to this house. You want to move them forward. You're, that's your job to constantly move them forward. So if you get too stuck on your listing and, and getting trying to get this listed and you take their eye off of why they actually contacted you, which is moving forward to get, help them with that move, then that can jeopardize your transaction. So I think as long as you keep that in mind, then you should be you're going to be coaching them along. Yeah, I mean, I I'm, 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 he's, I mean he's still he's, after everything I've shown right. him, he's still going to listen to me. Yeah, I mean I don't know that there's no doubt about that, but I just need to get him back onto the track. Yeah, you know what I mean because he he's, <clears throat> he's a single guy. Right, he's downsizing, but he. The problem was we went to a brand new construction, and, and you're looking at downsizing to X amount of square footage, but yet you, you're you're buying into the same price that you're trying to come out of. So you know it's right. it's kind of a even though he will pay he's got quite a bit of equity in what he got yeah. and he has to sell. So anyway, it's just it's just a matter of me. So what's he going to, what's he going to do with that money? Why doesn't he just yeah. lease out his house and? And have it as a because, because he bought it as a foreclosure. It yeah. was a Sotheby. Okay. He bought it as a foreclosure for two hundred sixty-eight thousand dollars in Flower Mount. Well, Flower Mount. It's Highland Village. Right. Yeah. Within a mile of the lake. Yeah. Three car garage, four bedrooms, three and a half bath. I mean, it's just absolutely perfect right. case scenario yeah. with a forty yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a great house. Yeah. Great house. Um. And he. He knows he's got that, and his daughter's off from college, and so he just he wants to go down to about 2,000 square foot, three bedroom, you know, two bath, blah, 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 and use the equity that is in between those two numbers, because now I'm pricing it out at the highest yeah. of 419. So I would be, yeah, I, I would, that's where your lead follow up comes in. You know, it's uh, touching base with him every every few weeks. Yes, I did. And you got, did you get that utility bill last month? It could be about three hundred bucks less at where you're moving. <laughs> you know? right. Did you? What? How much? How's that lawn looking? You, yeah. you, so just always, you know, you're always, always closing. And he has a, he's an assistant chief of fire department, so he's there's a potential that the chief is going to be retiring. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. and so that became a factor. Right. And I said, well, you know, you can't always wait on someone else's possibility. Right. You know, right. Yeah. You, but you know what you're possible to tell. Well, I have to stay in Flower Mound if I have, I don't have to place them in the fire right. And I said, okay, well, then that's where we need to focus. Yeah. So that's someone that would be lead follow up. As long as you're going on two or three other appointments, then that's, you know, and he's in your system, you're following up, then you've got a lot more, you know, a lot more on your plate. But, but that's still a better use of time going on an appointment like that. Now, he needs to be sending you other referrals. You know, who else that's does he know? That's thinking about selling, or that may use your services because I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got the All right, good program. deal. So, Morgan, I yes. have a question here. Um, the training that my Perry uh, has going to leave follow up. He has like you know three, uh, uh, three, 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 three. Yeah. Did you um, follow that? Power. Letting it ring three times yeah. and calling the three, three times. Contacts, oh. Three contacts and then. Three contacts and three. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. But he wasn't, I mean, he didn't spend a lot of time with his league. Well, I spent the, I always spent the most time on business development. I mean, when I was prospecting, I would spend two hours a day prospecting but for new contacts and one hour on lead follow up. So that was. What I did, but I also spent a lot of time putting out flyers because I did all these flyers myself. So in the afternoon, and we just wrote a sample business plan, and it includes in the, the late part of the afternoon is it, it work that in with your previewing to where you're out doing door knocking or putting flyers out or kind of something that's out in the field, working with these small business owners to negotiate the discounts with them. You know, I was 22, 23, I didn't really have the I didn't know of anyone else that did that, so I didn't. It was I didn't really want to reinvent the wheel. It made sense to me, but I was I wanted to do that, but since no one else had, I just had I didn't pursue it. But now, when Tom Ferry is promoting it from stage in Anaheim, California, to four thousand realtors, 
obviously it's working and we've got agents doing it now too. So, and it goes back to real estate being hyper local, you know, in that community, knowing your community, working with your community vendors. So, um, I would say to just comment, unless you just had so much business, I, I would get rid of somebody after three contacts. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they might not yeah. be an A anymore, but maybe make them a B. But still, yeah. you know, get in front of them. Get in front right. of them. Because it's a relationship, and that that is that's something that um, Mike Ferry. He, he's all of these trainers. You'll have to understand they're very extreme. That's the way they sell their services. That's the way they differentiate themselves. Brian Buffini by referral only. Yeah, it's so you you have to understand they're in business for themselves and they're so as a brokerage. You know my background. I used all of them. I used certain things from all of those trainers, and they're all really good. The thing is, you've got to know the Mike Ferry first before you can really implement Brian Buffini and Dirk Zeller and David Knox and you know. Look, bro, work around a lot of these others. So, um, but the relationship component is is really not emphasized enough, probably in the Mike Ferry training, and it's extremely <laughs> important. And that's what you need to think about on those contacts: is that okay? Well, if they're not going to buy from me, then how can I leverage this relationship? How can I build this relationship deeper to where they know that I care about them and I want what's best for them, and that they Understand that enough to refer me to other people that they know, and that's a real important component. Right, that's where that newsletter comes into is that that way the the whole newsletter. The point of that is that you're top of mind, so they get something from you, and you're always top of mind. And the, the three 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 is per lead. It's not necessarily precise. So. Yeah, the the three 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 probably relates more to your time, I know I I always wanted to focus on five active buyers and sellers at a time. And then as I grew my business, I started emphasizing less of my buyers and more just on my sellers. Now, do we have uh, several postcards that actually work? We do. It's basically that I have a buyer campaign, but um, I'll, I'll get those out. I don't know if we've... Do we have those on the Google Drive? Okay. 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 Well, thank you guys. Um, this has been a good. I appreciate your time and for Bill and Kathy. Those guys that are on the podcast. Have a fantastic week.